I don't know if Pastor Jabin was breaking the rules this week by giving me a call about this weekend because I'm not trying to get you to question what your pastor is telling you on the screen, but like we were talking and he's just itching to get back, you know what I'm saying? Like he, he, he can't wait to get back and, and we were talking about what God's done over the last couple of weeks and, and he asked me to, uh, to bring a message that I brought uh, to a night service here, I think four or five years ago. And he was like going, man, if you wouldn't mind, there was a message that you brought about the gospel like three, four, five years ago, and, and I just wish that our whole church heard it, because I think it's going to help us get ready for what God has for us. We need to consistently and continually revisit the gospel, the saving good news that comes from the heart of God and is offered to every man, woman, and child. City Light is actually a gospel outpost. That's the reason by his mighty sovereign hand, he is guiding a building program that will literally change the landscape of Las Vegas. We ain't just building a church. We're, we're building God's house that's going to be a light to a dark city. That's going to share good news to a world that needs to hear good news from the heart of God. But we have to explore again and again what this gospel good news message is for a number of reasons. Number one, the gospel has to be clear in your head and your heart so it can dance sweetly and naturally on your lips. There can be no space or place for confusion or convolution regarding what our core message really is. Because it is not if, it is when God opens the doors for you to share with your family, with your friends, with your neighbors, with the people that you work with. When that door opens, we must be able to step through that door and point towards Jesus and offer a compelling invitation to come into the kingdom. The gospel has to be clear in our heads and our hearts so it can dance sweetly and naturally on our lips. We have to always re-engage and re-explore and be re-enamored by the gospel because how many know that good news can become old news real quick? Have you heard that phrase before that familiarity can breed contempt? As good as something is, if you're around it long enough, it becomes a little meh. A little bit, ah, uh, been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, shrunk in the wash. Think about the first time you ever ate a Krispy Kreme. Woo! <laughs> Hundreds of years of technological advancement has led to this glorious invention. So crispy, so creamy, so light, so fluffy, so tasty, all at the same time. You lined up for that Krispy Kreme. You bought a whole dozen of those Krispy Kremes. You sat in your car by yourself eating that whole dozen of Krispy Kremes. Why? Because it was a new taste to your lips. But now you can drive past a Krispy Kreme store and not even pay it a second. Look, has the Krispy Kreme changed? No. It's just that you've been around it long enough. And as crazy as it sounds, as mind-blowing as it may be, that can happen to the gospel as well. It was God who took your breath away. It was him who stepped in on your journey. It was his hands that snatched you out of the miry clay and put your feet on solid rock. Those years ago, your heart would swell with passion every single time you thought on God, but now you can come into church feeling cold. You can remain cold. You can leave cold. Did God's love change? No. It's just that we've been around it long enough. Never allow that to happen. The gospel must always cause your breath to be taken away, your skin to tingle, your mind to explode. If the gospel continues to be good news in your heart, 
You will have no problem sharing it with your family and your friends. You will not be able to keep it to yourself. We have to consistently return to the gospel good news. We have to do it because we mess up the news. If I started with a message down this side and ask you to whisper it into the ear of the person next to you, what do you call that in America? You'll call it telephone. In Australia, it's called Chinese whispers. We're not as politically correct. <laughs> Don't even know what that means. I just know that I'm a little triggered and offended. <laughs> but if I start with a message down this side, it'll end up being a different message down this side. And as crazy as it sounds, thousands of years of history, man's agenda people's biases and prejudices can mess with what the gospel message actually is. Time distorts the gospel. We must come back to this ancient message which is equally timeless and delve again and again into this glorious gospel good news. We've got to explore it because some people in this room right now have never actually heard the good news. Somehow it has missed you. You've been around church, you've heard the songs, you've sat through some messages, you may have been brought up relatively religious, but somewhere along the line, you missed the good news. You don't have a clear picture painted through the lens of the scriptures. In fact, your picture of God is one of an angry guy in the sky with a lightning bolt in his hand trying to take you out because you break his commands. You're scared of him. And that is no good news at all. That is intimidating news. That's bad news. Jesus didn't come to earth, live a perfect life, die an unjust death, be buried in a tomb, overcome sin and death, just so that you would walk around fearful of God. No, he came to deliver some gospel good news. Okay, Dan, you built your case. Big Asian guy who obviously does a lot of upper body in the work but neglects his legs. What is this good news you speak of? Well, I'm glad that you asked. The whole good news message that comes from the heart of God and is unpackaged through the scriptures, Genesis through to Revelation, is built on this simple premise. God made you for him. You were made by God. And for God. And your soul will be restless until you find peace with God. You weren't made just to watch him from a distance. To ponder the potential of a relationship. You were created in his image. Unlike any other creation in the universe. To know intimacy with him. To know purpose through him. To find life healing and hope through him, this, my friends, come on, is very good news. That's the reason Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11 would say, God has set eternity in the hearts of man and woman. Inside of you, there is a beacon that is going off 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it will not be satisfied until it finds its satisfaction in God. You cannot fill that space with money. You cannot fill that space with pleasure. You cannot fill that space with success. You cannot fill that space with fame. You can do whatever you can try to do in your strength to deal with that beacon, but it will not be satisfied because it was put there by God and for God. It rings in your soul. Because God is consistently and continually from sunup to sundown wooing you back to him. That's the reason when you study history, stare down the annals of time, dabble in archaeology, do any study in the human journey, you will see that we are knit together by this common thread. We have always asked questions about God all over the planet right now. As scientific as we are, as modernized as we are, as technologically advanced as we are, we as a humanity are still fundamentally asking the same question. Hey God, how do we get to know you? Do, do you want to get to know us? 
Uh, we, we have some theories and some ideas around connecting with you. We would love to find some resolution. That's the reason as you study history, for as far back as you can look, you will see that we have all asked questions about God. When you study religions, you will see that fundamentally, they are all trying to deal with the same question. How do we find connection and relationship with God? I'm looking for meaning. It can only come from the maker. I'm looking for purpose. It can only come from the producer of the heavens and the earth. I'm looking for hope. Only the one whose hands hold the universe can deliver it. And what's fascinating is you study religions, you'll see that every religion, every pursuit of God, every set of questions or theories about God are all built on the simple same premise. Every world religion, every human pursuit of God is effectively the same. And here is the basic premise. For you to relate with God, for you to find the meaning, the purpose, the hope, the healing, the future in Him, you have to make your own way to Him. Every religion has its nuances, it has its distinctions, but when you study every world religion, throughout history, they are all built on that same premise. You must make your own way to Him. Every religion except for Christianity, except for the gospel, except for the good news. Every religion is built on that premise. It's like, okay, you got that beacon going off in your heart, make your own way to Him. That's the reason right now on planet Earth, there are more than a billion people, my Muslim brothers and sisters, who are desperately trying to climb their way and make their way to God. Not throwing shade at anyone's pursuit of God, just making some observations about the game plans. So therefore, my Muslim brothers will wake up in the morning and they'll begin to pray. Then five times a day, they'll pray again. There are offerings they must give at, fast and feast they must follow. And if it ever comes to a point where they can give their life for a holy cause, if they give it, they will find themselves immediately in the presence of their maker. Again, not throwing shade have many dear Muslim friends. I'm just trying to make the observation. The game plan is still you trying to make your way to him. Yet there are another more than one billion people on planet Earth whose game plan isn't necessarily service and sacrifice or giving their life for a holy cause. Many of my family, specifically, are Buddhists. And their, their game plan isn't service or sacrifice or trying to impress the maker, but to find inner enlightenment. That your salvation is found in yourself. That if you can empty yourself of every earthly lust or desire, you'll be free to embrace your inner godness and God himself. So right now, on planet earth, there are more than a billion, many of the people within my own family tree, who wake up in the morning and they begin to meditate. They begin to meditate on suffering, on how to embrace the moment, and to look within themselves. There are eight noble paths and four noble truths, and if they can do this for long enough, they believe that they can ascend to a state, a nirvana, if you will, where they can embrace God and be a God themselves. Now, I'm not trying to make any observations about the validity of meditation, I definitely am not throwing shade at people's dedication to their pursuit of noble paths and noble truths. I'm just trying to make the observation, at the base of this religion, it's still them climbing their way to God. Yet there are another more than one billion people on planet Earth right now who are saying, you know what, it's not service, it's not sacrifice, it's not meditation or emptying yourself. It's, it's living a good life, dying, and you get to come back and do it again. I, I have my neighbors across the road from the house that I live in back in Anderson, South Carolina, are Hindus. And they believe in reincarnation. That if you live your life 
based on how you treat that life, you will come back in another life form. And if you can string enough good lives together, you can ascend to a place with the gods and be a god. So here you are, you're trying to be a good person, a moral individual, and you come back in a nicer life form. But this time you make some mistakes and you come back as a lower life form, like a cat. So how are you a good cat? You're a dead cat. And you come back and, and then you live a good life, you die. You live a good life, you die. You live a good life, you die. And eventually, if you can string enough good lives together, you ascend to a place where the gods are and you're a god yourself. Again, and not throwing shade, not trying to belittle even in the humor that I introduce, I'm not trying to get anyone in any way, shape, or form to laugh at somebody's honest pursuit of God. I'm just trying to make the observation. At the base of this religion, it's still them making their own way to God. Now, I'm looking at your faces right now, and I can see the appreciation on your faces going, Wow, Dan, thank you so much for this educational lesson on world religions. This is so nice. It's so interesting to know what other people in other parts of the world believe. But Dan, this doesn't really apply to us. You know what I'm saying? Because those are weird foreign religions. We're American. And we don't do that kind of stuff here. You know, especially out here in Las Vegas. We kind of, we, we don't do those kinds of, you know what I'm saying? But can I suggest to you that even here in America, a lot of people who don't even usually go to church, if you were to ask them about the game plan to get to God, they would just try to climb a ladder as well. Have you heard this one before? Hey, if you want to get to know God, just be a good person. Just be a moral individual. Don't cheat on your wife and don't cheat on your taxes much. And <laughs> give to charity when you can. Um, and at the end of the day, you'll find yourself standing before the big guy in the sky, and he'll weigh up your life. And if you've done more good stuff than bad stuff, then you're good with him. Uh, but, but if you've done more bad stuff than good stuff, then you're going to a pretty dark place. But don't stress that much because all your friends are probably there as well. That's, I hear that all the time. And again, I'm not trying to throw shade at America in any way, shape, or form. In fact, it is against my immigration agreement to do so. <laughs> so if you're watching right now, God bless America. <laughs> I'm just trying to make the observation. For a lot of good, red-blooded Americans who are brought up in a post-Christian society, if push came to shove, their game plan of getting basically to God and a relationship with Him is them, come on, climbing ladders of morality to Him. Let's be real. Now I'm looking at your faces and you're going, yeah, yeah, you're right. That's what America is like, but we're more than Americans. We're Christian Americans. And there's no way we climb ladders to God. But can I suggest to you as someone who, is tra who has been traveling back and forth to the U.S. for nearly the last 20 years talking about the good news, I have found a lot of people even brought up around church. When you really ask them what the game plan is in connecting with God and growing in relationship with God, really it's just climbing ladders to Him. That means I've got to come to church and it's the right church and we have to read our Bibles and we've got to pray every day because I want to grow, because I want to grow and, and I've got to give my money. I'm not going to give all of my tithe, but I'm going to give enough to impress God and, and when I get to church, I'm going to sing. Oh, I'm going to sing. During the fast songs, I'm going to jump up really high because the higher I jump, the closer I am to God. During the slow songs, I'm going to look really sad and constipated because the sadder I look, the happier he is. I'm going to amen the preacher. Now, I love it when people come to church. I love it when people make good decisions about right and wrong. I love it when people give and sow and tithe their time and their talent and their treasure. But if you think it's your good works that impress a perfect God, homie, you're just trying to climb a ladder too. So here we find ourselves as a humanity, all knit together by this common thread. 
made by him and for him, only ever finding peace with him. And so we have, as a humanity, since the beginning of time, been trying to climb our way back to him. But just like our forefathers and mothers behind us found, many in this room have found. As high as you climb, as hard as you try, we still fall short. I'm reaching out with everything that I've got, but we still fall short. Houston and Vegas, we have a problem. <laughs> we're trying with our religious zeal. We're giving, we're serving. We're trying with everything that we have, but we still fall short. Our sin still has us falling short of a perfect God. As much as we try to think our way to God, theologize our way to God, reason our way to God, meditate our way to God, Isaiah 55 rings true when it says that his thoughts are still higher than our thoughts. As good as we are, as many good acts as we engage in, as many good deeds as we try to unfold, trying to cancel out the bad, we still fall short, as Isaiah 55 would also say, that our good works before him still fall short. In fact, in the grand scheme of God's perfection, they're like filthy rags. How can you impress a perfect God with stained hands? We still fall short. Made by him and for him, we as a humanity, by default, fall short of him. This, my friends, is the bad news. Here comes the good. And then Jesus shows up. Come on, I'm going to say it one time. Come on. And then Jesus shows up. And he flips the script. And he changes the game. He diagnoses the problem. That in your own human strength, you can't make your own way back to God. So he comes from heaven to stand on our behalf and make a way to Father God for us. That's the reason he would declare in John chapter 14 and verse 6 that he'll be the way, he'll be the truth, and he'll be the life. That no one else can come to the Father except through him. Now I can understand why on the surface that seems like a very narrow-minded, even egotistical and bigoted kind of statement that only Jesus is the way. That no one else gets to come to the Father except by Him. I remember this statement getting me into so much trouble when I was in college. I started following Jesus as a 17-year-old. I became one of those crazy Jesus freaks, you know what I'm saying? Went to the, the Christian bookstore, bought the biggest cross made out of real nails. Put it around my neck, trying to walk around, getting into gospel fights. <laughs> Strangely, God made my two best friends during my freshman and my sophomore year in college. One was a Muslim and one was a Buddhist. Like a Christian, a Muslim and a Buddhist walked into a bar. And a, it was like a, we were like a joke every weekend. And me and my friend Hakan used to fight so much. And my friend Tuan used to always jump in and say, Dan, why do you have to be so pig-headed about this Jesus stuff? Why can't we all agree we're just on different paths leading to the same place? Why can't you just believe like everyone else believes that it's like one tree with many branches and many roots and everyone's going to arrive in the same place? Why do you have to say that Jesus is the only way? And my response was always, when Jesus said he's the only way, he wasn't being narrow-minded. He wasn't being judgmental. He wasn't trying to be mean. He was just trying to show everybody that everyone had tried their way, but their way fell short. You can't get there through your energy. You can't get there through your goodness. You can't get there through your holiness. So Jesus had to show up, the perfect Lamb of God, to stand on our behalf, to make a way we couldn't make 
for ourselves. It's not your blood, it's his blood. It can't be your pain, it was his pain. It's not your sacrifice, it would be his. When Jesus said that he's the way, the truth, and the life, he wasn't being narrow-minded. He was just trying to let you know you tried, but you fell short. But fear not. God loved you so much, he sent me to get you. Smile. This, my friends, is very good news. And that's what he does. That's the reason in Philippians chapter 2, he says that this is Jesus, and even though he is fully and totally God, Father, Son, and Spirit from the beginning, he put aside his Godness and came to earth and took on the very nature of a servant. He comes to you. He stepped into the earth and he found a religious leader named Nicodemus in the dark. He found a woman wrapped in sin by a well. He found a demoniac tearing his life apart across the Sea of Galilee in a place called the Decapolis. He would find a, a thief who was also a tax collector at his booth, he would come into the earth and find people where they were at. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, and becoming the very nature of a servant, he would not allow his service to end with the pouring of a drink or the breaking of bread. But this servanthood would lead him to serving us on a cross. That's why we point towards a bloodstained cross. This is how desperate God was to get to you. As he would serve us by receiving the lashes we all deserve from the sins that we've committed. Because it would be by those stripes we could be healed. He would be spat upon, rejected, and humiliated. So that we, by his grace and for his glory, could rise as men and women who could live our lives with dignity. He would have a cross placed upon his shoulders. But do not be mistaken, that was never his cross. That was your sin. It was your shame. It was your curse. It was your failure. It was your mistakes that was laid upon his shoulders. He'd be carried to a hill he created. He'd be laid down on that cross. Nine inch nails would be driven through his hands and his feet. Pinned to a tree so that you could be set free from eternity. He'd be hoisted in the air. Pain would fill his body. So relief could fill yours. He would hang there. And with a word, he could call all of the angelic forces to come and relieve him from that pain. But he stayed there so that you could get to a place of wholeness with the Father in heaven. He would eventually breathe his last so that you could breathe your first. <gasps> Darkness would befall the earth from noon to three. So light could rise in your journey from now into eternity. All of heaven wept as all of hell celebrated. The king is dead. The king is dead. They would take his crumpled body they would lay him in a tomb. A rock would be rolled over the front. But little did hell know, God loved you so much he would send his son Jesus down to die for you. But he loved you too much to allow him to stay dead. Because three days later, that rock would shake, that rock would roll, 
And Jesus would overcome that grave so that you can overcome yours. And he lives today. He's not a religious leader who died for a cause. He wasn't a moral man who was martyred for good. He was the Son of God who came to earth to find your life and to take hold of it, even if it cost him his. This, my friends, is very good news. And that's the reason my heart swells with joy. That's the reason I never find it hard to get ready to declare this story. Because even though religion says you need to make your own way to Him, Jesus showed up and He made a way for you. Smile, my friend. This is very good news. And this reason I'm pumped right now is also the fact that my mother never breastfed me and gave me Red Bull instead, but... I'm pumped because this is the gospel. This is the gospel because you're surrounded by people who you feel are a million miles away from God. But that's good. He's traveled more than a million miles. He'll keep on going until he finds them. Come on, this is really good. Because you can be sitting in the room right now and you can feel like the most disqualified person on earth. The lines I've crossed, the things I've done. Dan, the rap sheet that I carry around. If you saw what I was doing even last night, I'm in such a dark hole, Dan. Well, if God, through His Son Jesus, would step out of heaven down to this earth, why do you think there's a hole so deep that you can dig that He won't come down to find you there? That's the reason He set you up this morning. This ain't just church. This is a Jesus ambush. Shazam! Surprise! He's come to grab hold of your life. Come on! Smile! This is really good news. Because it means that even though you are wound up, bound up, being ground up by religious expectation, those cords tied and so firmly around your soul, then you never feel good enough for Him. This is good news because the gospel declares it's not your goodness, it's His it's not your blood, sweat, and tears. It was His. And if Jesus would step out of heaven into earth and become a servant, why do you think He wouldn't take the time to lovingly and carefully untangle those cords of religiosity that crush your soul? Come on, smile. This is good news. Isn't it good? It's good news because there's someone in the room right now who, who would consider themselves an atheist. I don't believe. I'm just here because the girl that I'm chasing told me that she goes to church on Sunday mornings. So I said, I love church too. All that praying and stuff, I'm, in, I'm into it. So in your heart, you've already organized a thousand reasons of why there are holes in this story. And the good news is, I don't need to convince you. Because God's already made a way to chase you. And guess what? He's fitter than you. And he'll probably cut you off at some point. <laughs> the men and women who will be drawn to this great city in the years ahead, need this message more than anything else. And this, my friends, is what you as a City Light family have been called to. Not just the setup of another religious institution, but a house that God would build to shine light into a dark world and to share, come on, some very good Come on, praise Him in the Lord.
Religion is about us climbing to God. The gospel declares a God so good, he climbed down a ladder to you. And so what I want to do as we finish up our time together is do two things. Number one, over the last 29 minutes, some of you all have been feeling this strange knocking at your heart's door. You, you thought it was that, that Filipino food you ate last night and you're going, oof, that adobo ain't sitting right. <laughs> no, no. You're asking the question, is that what it feels like when God tries to get through to you? My, my friend, the answer is, yup. That's exactly what it feels like. And God's trying to exchange a religious pursuit for a relationship with a person who is Jesus Christ. I found it, I didn't find him. He found me when I was 17 years old. And he's been walking with me and transforming me and restoring me for the last 30. And for you to start an everyday relationship with Jesus that flows into forever, it's simply just opening up your heart's door to him. When you ask the question, well, if he made everything, why doesn't he just come on in? Well, God doesn't love you in response to your loveliness. He loves you because that's who he is. He can't help himself. And love never forces itself. So it will come all the way from heaven to a school on a Sunday morning and tap gently. Can you feel it? Would you open your heart to him? Would you allow me to lead you in a prayer that heaven will hear and I promise you it will change your eternity. So with every eye closed and every heart open, if you know that this morning was a setup to have your heart blown wide open by a king who wants to fill it, would you let me pray with you? Would you let me maybe give you the word? So with every eye closed and every heart open, if you're saying, Dan, I don't want religion. I want a relationship with Jesus and I have felt him knocking at my heart's door and I want to open up to him. If that's you, when I count to three, I want you to lift your hands so high in the sky. Are you ready? If you want to open up your heart to a relationship with Jesus, when I count to three, lift your hand. Here we go. One, two, three. Lift your hand high in the sky. High, high. Hands everywhere. Keep them lifted high. Keep them lifted high. All right, I'm going to pray a prayer out loud. And if you lifted your hand, I want you to pray it out loud with me. In fact, I'm going to invite everyone in this room to do it together as an act of support and unity. Come on, let's do it. Dear Jesus, I open up my heart to you. Thank you so much for coming so far to find me fill me with your love help me by your spirit to live now for your glory amen